going to be talking about introducing domain-driven design into Joomla, but I should start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Chris Davenport, and um, I started uh, working with Mambo, Joomla's predecessor, back in 2003. And uh, I was invited to join the core team, as it was at that time, back in 2006. I've been in uh, leadership positions ever since. Uh, and I'm currently on the production leadership team of PLT. Um, I'm currently the least team leader for 3.6, 3.7. Of course. Come on, Mark. <laughs> you haven't missed anything, don't worry. Um, this 3.7 is the release that was formerly known as 3.6. Um, and I'm also on the architecture team for Joomla X, which was formerly Joomla 4, but to be, to be fair, I haven't actually done any work on that for, for some months now, because I've been focusing on the... Not really. Not really. Yeah, we'll go in there and we use it. Yeah. Um, so, I thought it'd be nice to add a, a subtitle to this, to this talk, and the subtitle is uh, Code is for Humans, Not Machines. Um, and that might seem a bit odd because you know we write code that runs on computers, and we, you know, if we didn't have a computer, it wouldn't work. Um, we need the machine to execute it. But if you uh, remember fax machines, if anyone's old enough to remember fax machines, um, when you send a fax to somebody, um, the machine doesn't actually understand the message at all. You're sending the message to the person. And in the same way, we don't really write the code Sorry, for the machine. Come on, Victor. Sorry. Uh, we don't really write the code for the machine. Uh, if the machine doesn't understand the message, if it doesn't understand the code, then that's a syntax error. Right? So the, the code, when we're writing code, we're really writing it for people, not machines. So with that in mind, uh, Code is, writing code is an act of human communication. We should be aware of the limitations that, that humans have. Um, and, and one of those limitations, which you're probably already familiar with, uh, comes from this paper by Miller, who said that uh, humans have this limitation of only being able to deal with seven plus or minus two, uh, roughly, uh, items at any one time. It's a short-term memory restriction that we have. Um, so that's obviously a bit of a problem when we're dealing with, with the real world. The real world is messy and uh, complicated and it has lots of things that you have to pay attention to all at once. Um, and we struggle to make sense of it. So unless we have particularly large brains, we have to really simplify the problem. We have to simplify the models that we're using. So faced with a complex system, uh, what do we do? We need to divide the system up into, into chunks in some way. Uh, that is, we have to divide it into smaller, more manageable pieces, pieces that can actually fit inside our brains. Um, and the way we do that is to, is to chunk, but chunking in a particular way that those chunks have to have particular characteristics. Uh, for example, they have to have a high degree of internal cohesion. And each chunk should really be coupled to only a small number of other chunks. Uh, because you know, seven plus and one is two. If there's any a limitation, there's a limitation on a number of other things that we can keep in mind all at once. Uh, and we also want those those chunks to be loosely coupled to each other because we need to deal with change over time. So we need to be able to swap some of those parts out occasionally. And it also needs to be done at multiple scales, so small scales and large scales as well. Um, so, which sounds a bit practical, really, doesn't it? But, and it probably is. That's what we need to do, but the question is how do we do it? Uh, there are lots of ways in which we can slice the pie. So how do we, know, how do we decide where to make those slices? And that's important because where you make the chunks can make a big difference. It's a bit like uh, overfitting the uh, data to in statistics. You don't want the, the too fine a granularity because it makes uh, the problem more, more fragile, the solution more fragile. So we need to find uh, the natural grain in the problem that we're trying to solve. Or grains, I should say. It's not like splitting wood. There are actually multiple ways in which you can split. And uh, we know a lot of these uh, ways in which we can split already. Um, for example, we can split according to 
the rate at which change occurs in the software. So um, you, you, we have heuristics like uh, we encapsulate what changes, or, or we, we keep uh, what's, what, stay, what changes together should stay together, things like that. We can also uh, make these splits along consistency boundaries. So if you need atomic consistency, then those things uh, need to be uh, together. Right? If, if eventual consistency is fine, then it doesn't matter, you can spread them apart. So that's another natural way in which you can split these things. And we can even split along organizational boundaries. So for example, we're familiar with uh, having front-end versus back-end developers. Right? So there's, a, there's an organizational boundary there. Um, with people have different skill sets, so we can actually split the software that reflects that bank. And we already split the code in certain ways. Um, you're probably already familiar with layering the software. And that's something I'll talk about later when I talk about the service layer. Um, the layers, again, fall along these natural uh, grains in, in the software. And we can also split the code vertically along functional boundaries, uh, which is effectively what components are doing in June. So we have uh, you know, banners and news feeds, uh, things like that. They're effectively um, functional boundaries that we're, we're encapsulating the code along those boundaries. So this talk is about domain-driven design. And what DDD gives us is a, is a powerful tool that can help us understand problems the problems that we're trying to solve and help us find those grains within the, within the problem space and come up with, with solutions, ways of dividing up those uh, problems and chunking the code effectively to, uh, to solve those problems. Um, above all, though, I think DDD is a tool that can help us achieve uh, the goal of making the code understandable, writing understandable code, people that peop uh, code that people can actually work with. Uh, and it started with this book by Eric Evans back in 2004. Um, has anybody read it? One person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> two. Okay, two people. That's good. Well, if you haven't already read it, I do recommend it. It's a very, very good book. Uh, it's quite thick. It'll take a while to get through it. But if you do read it, then you should read this book as well um, by Vaughan Werner. Uh, Partly because it has more concrete examples, and actually, it's, I think it's easier to uh, to learn about DDD in the first place by having uh, example code that you can actually see and, and you can understand it better what it actually does. Um, but also because it, it actually fills in some gaps in the original. So after Evans wrote the original book, some other things turned up that were actually turned out to be really important that weren't in the original book, and this this one fills the gaps. Um, in particular, it, it talks about domain events, which Evans didn't mention at all, or only in passing. Uh, they turn out to be really important, and I'll, I'll say some more about domain events in, in, in a little bit. So, before I go any further, I should really define what, uh, what I mean by a domain. Uh, and it's, essentially, it's this. It's basically the problem space in which, the, in which we're trying to solve a particular problem. It's nothing more than that. It's nothing particularly technical. Um, and what about DDD itself? Uh, Evans uh, himself offered a brief description of DDD in three parts. Um, the first part is that we should encourage, we should be encouraged to focus on the core domain. Uh, now, every domain there, within every domain, there is a certain part of that domain which is um, which is central to what the business does. It's the most important part. Uh, it's like the core business, so it's the, it's the things that reflect what you're doing, what the, what the code is all about, what the code needs to do, uh, what makes the system worth writing. And we should focus on that primarily, because everything else can then sort of fit into place out around it, we, but we, we have to solve that central problem. <coughs> and secondly, he says that uh, it's about domain experts and so software experts collaborating on the exploration of a problem. So the point here is that it's, it's an iterative process and that it, it requires the full uh, engagement of everyone, to the developers and the clients that we're working for. We can't do it in isolation. We have to actually engage uh, the domain experts in solving the problem as well. And we can't know everything about the problem up front or its solution. We have to explore the problem. It's an iterative process. And we do that by building models together. <coughs> 
And the third point he makes is that everyone involved in the project must speak the same language. Um, this is the ubiquitous, ubiquitous language. It doesn't mean that developers have to learn the language of the domain experts because the domain experts must also be prepared to learn or to, to adapt the language um, uh, that, that is required to, to understand the software. So you, you have to, co to converge on a common language. And that language has boundaries, so it's only valid within certain contexts, what, uh, what Evans calls uh, a bounded context. Um, so for example, if we're talking about uh, capital, the word capital, then it means one thing if we're talking about cities, but it means something else if we're talking about architecture. So when we define that ubiquitous language, we also have to define the context in which, it's, in which it applies. And the reason that's important is because we want, we want to avoid situations like this. Um, I'm sure you've all seen this cartoon or variations of it before. Um, it's critical to the success of, a, of our projects that we share the same mental, knowledge, uh, mental model of the, of the problem and the solution. And that has to go right the way into the code that we're writing. Um, so that the, the voc vocabulary that we use, the language that we use, is reflected in the code as well. So if, if we're talking about code, um, if we're talking about uh, domain involving customers, then I would fully expect that there'd be a class called customer somewhere in the code. Um, and if, if, we, if, if you change the language as we evolve the language over time, then we also need to be prepared to refactor the code and to make sure that the code always reflects that language that we use. using. So, uh, what we're aiming to do is to build an understanding of uh, the problem, build this domain model, this model, this, this, um, uh, this, the sum total of our knowledge about that domain. Uh, and it's not just code, this is, this is also documents, spreadsheets, records of conversations, everything. That, that sum total of all that knowledge that we've got is our domain model. And the models that we're iterating at each stage of the development um, are necessarily a simplification of that. They're a reduction of that. Um, we shouldn't attempt to model everything because it just gets too complicated. We should just model what we actually need to model at any one time. So that's essentially what uh, DDD is. Um, now there, there isn't going to be time in this talk to go in, uh, into any depth uh, in it. Um, you, you know, you kind of have to read books, but uh, um, what uh, there, are, there are really two halves to uh, DDD. Um, on the one side, you've got strategic modeling, so um, where we're Try, in my words, really <coughs> recognizing the, the, the natural grain in the, in the domain. And then DDD also provides a set of tactical tools that we can use to actually build software that is hopefully understandable by humans. Uh, and undoubtedly the strategic side is actually more important, but it probably takes longer to, to get the hang of the strategic side of it than it does the, the tactical tools. So rather than dwell too much on the, on the strategy side of it, I'll actually run through a few of the, the tactical tools that are available, and that gives you perhaps a flavor of, uh, of what DDD is about, and then you can hopefully go and read the books. So, um, to look at a few of these tactical things, the first one we'll look at is uh, entities. Uh, and entities uh, are pretty much what you would expect them to be. Uh, in, in DDD, they're, they're defined as something that has a unique identity. So there's a thread of identity running through their, their entire life cycle. Um, and the, the attributes, properties associated with the entity can change, change as much as you like. It doesn't matter as long as the identity doesn't change, because that's what makes the, the entity unique. So for example, if you have a customer, then uh, you know the, the address can change, the telephone number can change. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change. It's still the same customer. Right? The customer has an identity. And then uh, in, we have value objects. And value objects don't have any identity. Um, the classic example is money. So if, if I have five euros, 
it doesn't matter if it's in notes or coins or it's uh, just a number on a, uh, a bank balance sheet, it's still five euros, and one five euros is the same as any other five euros. It doesn't have any identity as such. And we almost certainly model those as being immutable objects in the code. There are a very limited number of cases where you don't make them, where they're not immutable, but I've never actually come across the need for having a mutable value object yet. And whether we model something as an entity or a value object depends on the context. So in a theater, for seats in a theater, for example, if we don't care where people see, uh, sit, uh, we're just selling tickets for whatever, an event, uh, then we could model those seats as value objects, because one seat is as good as any other. On the other hand, if, we're, uh, if the seats are numbered and we're selling tickets for numbered seats, then we would model those seats as entities, because the seat itself then has an identity. And it may be that in the same system, um, within one bounded context, a seat might be modeled as a value object, but in a different bounded context in the same system, you would model it as an entity. Um, next up, we have aggregates. Um, entities and value objects are not enough on their own. We sometimes need to group them together. We have groups of entities, groups of value objects, mixes of, the, uh, of those things. Um, and it, it makes a lot of sense to, to group these things along uh, consistency boundaries. So the idea is that the internal structure of, um, uh, of an aggregate is always consistent at any point in time. Um, and again, that's that natural grain within the, the problem that we're looking for. We look for the consistency boundaries. Once we find a consistency boundary, then we can tend to model it as being an aggregate. Uh, for example, we, uh, in, in, the, in the case of a car, uh, we, in a simple system, we might model that as, as just a, a, single, a, sim, a single entity. It has an identity. Um, but if you're a car dealer, you might also be interested in the parts of that car. So the engine in that car has its own serial number, has its own identity. You would model, model that as an entity in its own right. But it's still part of that aggregate of a car. And similarly, the tires or maybe the other parts might be modeled as entities or value objects, depending on whether they have identity themselves. So. Aggregates uh, effectively define the consistency boundaries within the within the software, and they uh, the consistency boundaries are defined really by the business rules that we have uh, within the system. So, uh, what Evans refers to as invariance. So, they preserve invariance. For example, if you have um, customers, if you might have a business rule which says that they must not exceed their credit limit. So that is, that is a business rule. It's important to the business that customers don't exceed their credit limits. Uh, therefore, we have that as a business rule within a customer aggregate. And the aggregate enforces that, that business rule. Um, and there is also uh, one entity within any aggregate, which is defined as the, the aggregate root. Uh, and that uh, basically all access to the internals of that aggregate are uh, you pass through the aggregate route. You don't, you generally you don't have any detailed understanding of what's inside the aggregate. It's more or less a black box. But if you need to access something like in the car, you need to access the engine somehow. And you would always go through the car entity in order to get to the engine entity. You would never try to get to the engine entity uh, directly on its own. And the aggregate route is actually the one that is charged with the responsibility for ensuring these invariants are preserved. And the only other um, tactical tool I'm actually going to mention is repositories, because at some, at some point or another, we have to, have to actually store these aggregates on a database or in another system somewhere, or put them somewhere, or retrieve them from somewhere. But we don't actually want to mess up our um, uh, code with uh, details about how the database works. That's, that's something we want to re remove from uh, the, the, the logic of our, of our software. So, uh, you know, our business rules, we need to make them explicit, but we don't want to clutter that code up with code that involves databases. 
especially as the databases very often change. And we don't want to we don't want to change the uh, the same bit of code which is, has our domain logic in it. So um, that covers the the objects. There's, there's a few other things that, uh, that are in DDD which I haven't got time to go into. Um, One of the important um, distinctions that uh, DDD makes is that there are two different kinds of logic within the system. Um, the first is, is domain logic. Uh, and this is the stuff that the business really cares about. It's, it's rules like um, customers can't exceed their credit limit, that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's important things, it's what makes the business tick. And then the application logic is pretty much everything else. Um, so, under application logic, you would you would have things like uh, logging, sending out notifications, uh, you know, generating a PDF and emailing it to somebody, uh, that kind of stuff. It's not stuff that the business really totally cares about. It's obviously important, but it's important in a different way. It's it's not what makes the business unique. It's it's peripheral stuff. And so that's a, again a natural grain within the software if we try to separate those two things out. So Evans uh, himself, this is how he describes the, the difference. So domain logic is responsible for representing the concepts of the business, information about the business situation, and business rules. And he describes it as being the heart of business software. So that's the stuff we really care about. Then application logic is, uh, it contains business rules and knowledge, but only coordinates tasks and delegates work to the next layer down. So we, ideally, we want to separate these these two kinds of logic into different layers within uh, within the code. And I'll, uh, that brings me back to the, the subject of layers. Um, and DDD actually talks about four layers. And these are essentially the same as the classical layers that you'll see in any uh, book on software architecture. Um, the only difference is actually in the middle layer there. So on the top layer, we've got the presentation layer, which is uh, user interface kind of stuff. That's that's pretty standard. Uh, and then we have uh, the application and domain layers, which is where the application and domain logic live. And then on the bottom, we've got the infrastructure layer, which, which deals with databases, file systems, networks, that's, that kind of thing. So it's pretty standard, but we separate out that middle layer into two. And how does that match up with Joomla? Um, well, the, the view um, is pretty much in the right place, as it were. Um, it, it's, uh, it's in the presentation layer. We do occasionally, I, I do occasionally see examples where we've got uh, application logic actually being in the, in the views. Um, it shouldn't really be there ideally, but I, uh, there are some cases where I kind of understand why it's there actually. On the whole, we're not doing too bad. Um, for controllers, we very often have application logic in our controllers. It's very, very common for that, for that to happen. And models are pretty much a mess. They're, they're a hodgepodge of all kinds of logic uh, and infrastructure concerns as well. So we very often have domain, uh, have uh, database logic within our models, which strictly speaking, we don't really want there. It's, it's cluttering things up. It's making it more, it's making it harder to understand the code because we're messing up uh, this separation of concerns. So ideally what we want to do is to remove the application logic from the controllers and also from the models um, and then put it into a separate layer which I'm calling here a service layer. Now in DDD actually that would be an application layer but um, it it's, would be confusing terminology uh, within Joomla. If we, if we suddenly started calling this an application layer it would cause all sorts of confusion because it doesn't mean quite the same thing in Joomla. Um, so the terminology I've been using is service layer which is actually which actually matches up the, uh, with the, the terminology used in the textbooks on, on software architecture. There. Uh, yeah, uh, people like Fowler, for example. Uh, Martin Fowler's book on patterns of enterprise application architecture talks about a service layer. So that's, uh, that's an introduction to DDD. Um, I want now to talk a little bit more about the idea of a service layer. I use, I've, I've tried to set the context of why I think a service layer is important. It's to do with this separation of concerns and getting a, a separate layer in there um, 
that separates out the domain logic from the application logic. Um, and this is, I'll, I'll take questions later, Marco. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, otherwise I lose my train of thought. <laughs> um, so uh, the reason we want to do it is, is actually to solve two quite specific problems within Joomla. The first is dealing with multiple channels. And by channels, I mean the, the, the different ways in which um, Joomla applications can be run, different ways in which you talk to Joomla applications. And we're all familiar, of course, with, uh, with using Joomla over the web. Uh, but increasingly, of course, we're getting uh, called more and more, I think, nowadays to write CLI applications. Um, and we're also, uh, there's also the Internet of Things coming up where we need to support other protocols like CoAP, uh, NFPTC, uh, MQTT. Um, uh, and also, if you're in a corporate environment, you might be talking about having systems connected by message queues. And we need to support all those sorts of things. But our um, controllers at the moment are very much tied, or tend to be very much tied to HTTP. It makes it difficult to actually run things over CLI, for example, that, uh, without doing some modifications to the controllers. So what we want to try and do is to separate the code out so that you have a, a channel dependent, the, the controller is basically channel dependent, um, the, the, the application logic that was in those controllers is moved into the service line. And then you can swap out uh, whatever control, front end controllers you want to, to use whatever channels you want. And the, and the, the rest of it will be high, behave exactly the same. And the other problem we want to try and address is intercomponent inter communication. So I, I talked before about this, this vertical, uh, these vertical functionality boundaries that we've got, which, in which, which are represented in Joomla by different components, so use feeds and so forth. <coughs> But there is no way, there is no standard way in which one component can talk to another. Uh, so very often we end up doing things like one component reading another component's database tables, or we have one component extending another the model classes in another in another component, and that leads to type coupling, which is very bad. Um, now, to be fair, at the moment there's no other way of doing it; you just have to do that. Uh, but it would be nice if we could actually have a standard API that allowed one component to talk to another in a very clean way. Uh, right, and ideally, if, uh, if possible, we'd like to be able to extend our backwards compatibility promise to that API. Um, so at the moment, uh, Joomla's backwards compatibility policy only covers things like uh, everything in the libraries uh, directory. Uh, and a few other things, but that's that's basically it. There is no API promise on uh, on components themselves. If we change, we could refactor com content completely, use different database structures and everything like that, and we wouldn't we wouldn't be breaking the Samba definition of uh, backwards compatibility. Now, we obviously, don't really want to do that because I'm sure that would actually break an awful lot of, uh, of software out there. But we, we, in theory, we could do it. But what we want to try and do is, is to define an API that will allow us to make a promise that we will not break that API going forward. Now, the service layer code is actually all already available, not necessarily finalized, but it's, it, it's already there. You can actually um, uh, download it, uh, try it out, kick the tires. Uh, please do so and give us some feedback. I'll probably move this repository into the Joomla projects repository at some point. It's also, I think, quite well documented as well. There's, there's um, um, quite a lot of uh, information there on how to set it up and run it. So uh, let's look at it a little more detail now, how the service there actually works uh, in, in this proposal. Uh, so you you interact with the service layer by sending it a command. <coughs> and internally, that command is routed through a command bus to a command handler. Now, in actual fact, you don't really need to know the details of how all that works. As, as a developer, you just need to know the API. And, uh, and if you're developing components, you need to know the commands and the command handlers. How the command bus works is pretty much irrelevant. 
Uh, if you're an advanced developer doing some very clever stuff, then you can actually modify how that command bus works if you want to. Most people won't need to do that. And uh, the, command, the command handlers are where your application logic lives. And it will make calls out to the model, which is where your domain logic lives. So that's where you get that separation of those two kinds of logic in the system. So once you've taken out the application logic out of your controller, this is pretty much all that's left in the controller. It's, it's just a couple of lines of code. Um, you instantiate a command. Um, you instantiate the service layer, the J service class, and you hand the command over to the, uh, to the uh, service layer. Now obviously this, the, there may be some other code prior to that which pulls the data out of the request and puts it into that command in the first place, but that's entirely the channel specific stuff you know, on a message queue or a command uh, or a MQTT or something like that. It would be completely different code in each case. So controllers will get a whole lot simpler because a lot of the logic that's currently in controllers is going to be moved into the service line. And the command objects are really, really simple. Um, they're basically just simple data containers. They don't really have any intrinsic beha behavior of their own. Um, they are actually value objects. Uh, they're also immutable. So once you once you uh, define the command, once you once you've instantiated that command with parameters that you pass through in the constructor, you can't then change it. And it's possible to put validation logic into the constructor itself. Um, and that's actually quite a good idea to do that. It's not essential, but it is quite good, uh, a good thing to do. So, uh, if, and if you do that, it's then impossible to create an invalid command. Because as soon as you try to put invalid parameters into the constructor, it'll throw an exception and say you can't do that. Uh, and the reason why we don't really want to put um, any behavior in the commands is because we can then serialize those commands and put them on command uh, uh, on message queues and send them around a network and stuff like that. We can do clever things like that. Most people won't need to do that, but it's it's nice to have that capability available for those that do. So here's an example of a, of a command. Um, <coughs> this is for something like uh, when you're registering a customer. Uh, and note here that I've actually called it register customer command. I've tried to make it as clear as possible, try to match the language that, that would actually be used. Obviously, this is a fake example, so we don't actually know what the language the customer would actually use. But let's assume that they say, I want to register a customer. So a register customer command. Um, the constructor there will take a name and the email address, and we'll just do some simple validation there to make sure the email address uh, um, is, is a valid email address, valid in the sense that it matches regex rules. If you want to do any sophisticated validation, like you know, you know, matching it to a database somewhere to make sure it's a previously not previously registered customer, or something, you wouldn't do it in the constructor of the command. You would do that in the uh, in the command handler in the application module. So commands are, command, uh, commands are passed through the command bus, which routes them through to uh, a command handler. Um, and you can decorate the command bus with middleware, which is all the advanced stuff that nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, you, you don't need to care about at all. Um, and the plan is to use Tactician, which is a, a, an open source command bus by the League of Extraordinary Packages. I think I've got that right. Um, the one, dis the one problem we have with it has, is actually it has a PHP 5.5 minimum requirement on it. So we're going to have to work something out about how we, we actually deal with that. So the command handler, is, as I said, is where your application <coughs> logic lives. Um, all the stuff we moved out of the controller and the stuff that the application logic that we moved out of the model will come into these command handlers. Um, and they're making calls out to the model, which is where your domain logic lives. By and large, these tend to involve orchestration type logic. So, you know, uh, you have a number of things that you need to do. Uh, it will do make sure that those type of things are done in, in, in sequence. Uh, and if things need to be pulled in from elsewhere, like you need to do an authorization check before you proceed to, do, to make an update in the domain, uh, 
then it will make sure that check is done. <coughs> that kind of logic is, lives in this, in this location. Uh, and the other thing that the, the command handler does is it returns domain events that are raised by the model. I'll come back to that in a second. So if we look at a command handler, um, this will be, this is a registered customer handler. Um, it has a handle method, which is where the uh, command gets routed through to. Uh, and it does the usual things that you would expect in, in this sort of code. So it essentially it's a model, does something with the model. Uh, and at the end, as you can see it, it then picks up any domain events that, that the model raised and just passes them back up to the command box. So domain events. Um, domain events are essentially records of something that happened in the past that, are, that is of importance to the domain expert. So we're not talking about low level events here, we're not talking about things like uh, you know, on after save events, that kind of stuff. These, these are events which are important to the business. So presumably a, when a customer registers is, some, is an event that is probably quite important. We want to know about customers who register. So we have an event uh, which we're going to call, uh, say, uh, customers registered or something like that. That will that will flag that up. That event occurred, uh, and as you would expect, they're immutable because obviously we can't change the past. The records of the past <coughs> events, so you would expect them to be immutable. Uh, and we model them as value objects. And similarly, there's no behavior associated with this. Thing. There's no real logic in these domain events. They're just simple message containers. So we can shut them around networks if we want to queue them up, do all sorts of stuff like that. So. Uh, when the command finishes executing, uh, what happens next is uh, any domain events that were raised are passed through to uh, a publisher, which then publishes them out to anyone who wants to listen, any listeners that have been registered for that event. Um, and uh, this is actually uh, an event um, class, and as you can see, there's basically nothing to it. It's dropped out simple. And the publisher, as I said, runs after the command has been executed. Um, it's actually implemented in the service layer code. It's implemented as command bus middleware, but that's a, that's a detail that is, is <coughs> uh, not important. Um, and you can actually register these listeners in a, in a number of different ways. Um, so, uh, oh, right, okay. So. Domain event listeners can contain pretty much anything you like uh, as far as code is concerned. And one of the typical things that we might want to do is send out notification emails. So that listener will listen to the customer's registered event and it might then decide, yeah, I, I want to have a listener <coughs> on that for sending out an email to notify the customer or notify the administrator that something's, that some, this event occurred. Um, it doesn't contain any domain logic. That's, that's actually important. These things li don't do not live in the domain logic layer and dom domain layer. Uh, we want to keep that domain layer as uncluttered as we possibly can and focused on the core business problem. Um, but we can create other commands. So if we want to say, well, if, if the customer was registered, then we need to do something else that's important in the domain. Then we can fire off another command within the, the domain event. So as I said, there's, there's several ways in which we can uh, register listeners. Um, and probably the easiest is uh, as, a, as a simple callback. And you'll notice here that we're using the uh, standard Joomla uh, event dispatcher to do this. And by default, that's what the, the service layer does. It just uses a standard uh, Joomla event dispatcher. Uh, I believe George was saying that there is another dispatcher available in the framework. So it might be that we actually swap that out and use that. I don't know. It doesn't, and to some extent, it doesn't really matter. If, if, if this doesn't meet your needs, you can actually provide your own dispatcher anyway. It doesn't really matter. Um, you can also register a closure if you want. So if, if in your controller you, you think, yeah, I, I want a notification that this has succeeded or not, then, um, or, or if you know, the customer, customer was registered, you actually want the controller to know that that happened then you can just register a closure before you pass the message to the, the command bus. And 
crashed. Okay. Um, and the other way, the, the other way you can uh, set up listeners is there's just as regular Joomla plugins. All right. So uh, by default, there is a plugin group called Domain Events, and uh, this will get called with uh, events like so on, on customers registered. You've got an on customers registered method. Uh, and you can do whatever you want in that. I'll take questions. Again. That's not working right. So, in addition to uh, commands, uh, you can also um, send queries into the service layer. Um, and queries are just like commands; they're, they're just very, very simple objects. No, no particular, no intrinsic behaviour. Um, but unlike commands, uh, queries actually return data. Um, Evans and uh, the, the DDD uh, books all refer to data transfer objects. Now in Joomla, we're used, well, this is the sort of thing we're used to already in Joomla because if you think about it, in your view classes, you have things like get items, uh, and that results in a, a call to the get items method in the model, which returns a bunch of data. Nine times out of 10, that probably isn't a, a class, it, it isn't a, an object, it can be an array of things. Uh, so uh, when we talk about DTOs here, uh, it, it might actually be an array rather than an object, or even just an integer or something. Uh, or an array of uh, data construction objects. Um, yeah, I suppose, an array of objects, yeah, you can do that. It doesn't, whatever comes back is going to be transferred back up, uh, up the chain. Uh, the command bus doesn't actually care uh, what, you know, whatever comes back, it will just can't convey. It, it doesn't um, impose any structure on what comes back. Um, and the reason that, that uh, we want to do this, this separation between commands and queries, we, we make a distinction between commands and queries, uh, actually dates back to Bertrand Baer. Um, who uh, was one of the pioneers of object-oriented programming. Uh, back in the 1990s, he talked about this idea of command query separation, uh, where every method should be a command that performs an action or a query that returns data, but not both. And that tends to be uh, the way in which we, we write code unconsciously. If you look at the code within Joomla, nine times out of 10, each of the methods within models uh, particularly, either either it updates something and doesn't but doesn't return anything, or it or it actually returns some data. It's, it's not often that you actually do both. So again, this is a natural grain within the software. If we actually say well, we're deliberately going to make sure that that happens within the code, then it does. Uh, it it has some benefits though. And uh, the way he expressed it actually was uh, that asking a question should not change the answer. Now, since then, it's been extended, uh, I think, by Greg Young, um, who talks about command query responsibility segregation, which is where you're separating the responsibility completely from uh, of commands and queries. So we're not just talking about having a methods having particular functions. We're actually saying here, we'll actually have completely different code to handle commands as against queries. Uh, and again, this is, this is to follow that natural brain in the software. And a service layer tries to make that explicit by having separate classes for commands and queries um, that have actually only very quite subtle differences in their behavior. So commands are not going to return any data, but they will, um, uh, any domain events returned will be processed. Whereas queries, uh, you won't raise any domain events, but you'll actually return data. There, are, there is another subtle difference as well in that uh, a command, you can't call a, a one command from within another command. Right? So you can't have <coughs> nested commands because that leads to all sorts of problems in understanding how the code is actually going to behave. So we deliberately serialize the commands to make sure you only run one at a time. Whereas queries, on the other hand, they're not going to change any data. So we can, we're quite okay with having hierarchical queries being called one query with another. That's perfectly fine. So uh, commands return nothing, but they, they can raise domain events. Um, queries return 
data transfer objects. And that's basically the API that we want to define. Okay, so this the, the API that we're talking about, component API, we're, we're talking about commands, domain events, queries, and the data transfer objects, and that's how you define that API. <coughs> So uh, just to wrap this up then, um, because code is for humans, not machines, we need tools to help us build uh, software systems that can be understood easily. And DDD is, is such a tool. Uh, it provides us with a, a set of strategies and a set of tactics that help us to understand, uh, that help us to tackle complexity. The subtitle of Evan's book is Tackling Complexity at the Heart of Software Systems. Um, it helps us to write code that aligns with the natural brains within the problems that we're, we're trying to solve. Um, and it helps us stand the chance of actually being able to understand the software systems that we've actually created in the end. And thinking on those, along those lines, this, the introduction of a service layer, um, we're trying to solve two specific problems, uh, that is uh, multiple channels and intercomponent communication but doing it in such a way that, that aligns with DDD and actually brings some of those concepts of DDD within, to, uh, within the code base, within Joomla. Um, and uh, hopefully it will not be completely alien to everybody. It's, it's a subtle way of bringing some of these ideas in uh, without shocking people too much. Uh, and we can hopefully also do it in a, in a way which is backwards compatibility, so, uh, which is backwards compatible. So, um, this, this stuff is entirely optional. You don't have to suddenly uh, go out and refactor all your components to work with a service layer just because we've introduced the service layer. It's there as a tool if you want to use it. If you don't, use, don't want to use it, you don't have to. That's fine. But obviously, if you do use it, then you have some advantages. A, you're creating more understandable code. B, you're, you have the potential to create a standardized API into your component, which will allow other people then to do interesting things with your component without the tight coupling that we've had to uh, endure in the past. So that's basically uh, what I wanted to say. So if your chance now to ask any questions. Yes, Peter. Um, so if you are going to use the command uh, bus uh, with the command, for instance, uh, using the CLI, how can you specify that the output should be uh, on both you like? You would like to use MGTT or something like that? On, on the output side? Yes, so you will trigger command bus using CLI, maybe on tap every hour, and the MGTT message is, is another it, So that, that would be the responsibility of the controller. All right, so you, typically your controller is going to set up the environment in which the command is going to run. So if you, if you, um, if you, if you say that you want the output to come out of MGTT, then it will be the controller's responsibility to set up the appropriate <coughs> view to make that happen. And in, in, in the CLI context, you don't ten, generally tend to have controllers as such. They're not, you know, because you don't really use MVC uh, within CLI so so much. Uh, but the code that you that is in your CLI code uh, program uh, is effectively the controller. You might not call it the controller, but that's what it is. Okay. Yeah. Just a question about the jQuery. The, the, the code that I showed yes. is, is, is the repo. Oh, the repo. The, the repository is there. You, that's that's live now. Yeah, that's that's what code. It works. Yes, it will, uh, it will be moved into the Joomla projects directory, yeah. <coughs> but I'll, I'll put a redirect in it. So. Yes. Actually, we have a question about uh, command-based segmentation. Uh, so, if, if we have command that is supposed to be a customer for the question, uh, is it fine that command creates a customer if it not exists? Or uh, sorry, I'm not with you. So, I'm just trying to ask a question about command queries and okay. okay. starting yeah. the other service yeah. So, if there's a, there's a method yeah. command that says uh, get customer. So, is it fine if that command actually writes code to uh, create a customer if it does not exist? Well, it's up to you to define what logic is is appropriate for 
your application. Right? So if if, uh, if you have a registered customer um, command coming in, and the customer doesn't already exist, or the customer already exists, it, up to you, you, you know, whatever is relevant for your code as to what happens at that point. You know, it might be that if the customer already exists, you want to throw an error of some sort. But it, instead of throwing an exception, what you might actually do is raise a domain event, which says customer has already been registered or something, like that, and then pass that back up. But of course, that all depends on what you actually yeah. need in your particular. That's why it's challenging to serialize the command and not have the commands. Sorry, I'm not. And that's why I think it's recommended to have serialized commands that have less than commands. So that this is recommended to right, so serialize them. Serialized commands, yes, okay, yeah, that's right. want to get into Joomla, um, it, it's, it was kind of scheduled to go into 3.6, which is now 3.7. It, it really depends on community feedback. If, if the community thinks it's a good idea, then we'll, we'll put it in. Um, I, unfortunately, because I'm the release leader for 3.7, it would be a bit unfair for, uh, for me to make that decision, right? <laughs> so I will, I will devolve that particular decision to somebody else, for, as far as 3.7 is concerned. If, if it's not actually ready to go to be merged anyway, it might go into 3.8, in which case the situation might change. Let me then speak for a brief. We'll put it in. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. That's my turn. Yeah, I totally agree with Jesse. And I would like to touch on the last part. That what we've seen here is beautiful new uh, technology that we want to have in Joomla at some point in time. That means that it will affect those working with core. They will be contaminated with that. But at least with the first uh, iteration of the Joomla X, uh, extension developers uh, would not need to use this at all. Uh, that's at least the plan. At some point in the future, X plus whatever, uh, we will be able to deprecate the stuff obviously. But Initially, yeah. it, you wouldn't be touched with it, right? Yeah, well, it's an open question as to at what point, if, if this gets in, it would be nice to refactor the core components. But at what time, at what point do we do yeah. that? And how do we do it? Because then, then you're talking then about potential backwards compatibility issues, especially if people have, have coupled through the database or extended, you know, like content model articles or whatever the class is that we've got. If somebody's extended that and suddenly that class disappears, it's going to break that code. Now, we had actually haven't made a promise that we're not going to remove that code. But on the other hand, I think it would be a, a bit um, not very nice of us to actually do that. I, I think, like in the first place, the, the core components should not be migrated. Right. Yeah, yeah. But more for the, the advanced extension developers who are looking for a better way yeah. to do things than it's nice. And I think the other advantage of doing that is that uh, the, the extension developers are going to find out any issues or any improvements yeah. before we actually have to refactor and touch the core components. Yeah. So how does this uh, have an impact on the routing layer? Uh, it, it shouldn't affect it at all. Uh, the, the routing, like the, uh, the, the URL routing, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Through, through to the component has already happened but before this kicks in. Right, because that, that's what that's how your controller gets called is through the routing. So that's already happened by the time you get to this. So it doesn't have any effect. And of course in, in things like CLI and MQTT and stuff like that, the routing doesn't right. is irrelevant. I mean routing is specifically a web thing. So this can this can also help us have commands like Laravel as an answer. I'm I'm not familiar with Laravel actually, so I don't know. So it's basically exposing you know, all of the functionalities to uh, yeah, I mean, pretty much everything that you can do over the web, you should be able to do over CLI. Now, there are some issues um, that we need to think about, uh, like how do we handle sessions? Because some of the some of the code is, you know, you've got session stuff in there. How do you separate that out? Um, it needs some more thought as to how we actually do that. And of course, if, if you're talking about some of the core components that we've got in Joomla at the moment, they're not going to be very, well, we're going to have to do quite a few modifications to them 
to make them work in this context. You know, there's a lot of refactoring to do there because, well, particularly our models, um, some of them are, are, are really not very well segregated. They're not very well coded in that respect. Um, populate state, for example, is a major problem. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's mixing up all kinds of logic that shouldn't be in there. And we've got to separate that out somehow. But it's not going to be an easy task to do that. I think um, I think we'll have to. Oh, five minutes. Okay, there's a time for one more question. Then, perhaps. Oh, yeah. Well, just pointing at him for a <laughs> In that case, any more questions? Yeah, Peter. Go on. Um, what if maybe a couple of links or something like that? So it's not part of Juno anymore. If that will be uh, just adapted to this whole model. So it, it, could, it, could it could be. Um, there's. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's possible. Um, what, I, I did actually do an experimental refactoring of Com Contact, but I actually only did the front end, which in retrospect was a bit of a mistake because it turns out there's actually really no domain logic in the front end of Com Contact at all. <laughs> you end up with nothing. <laughs> right? All the logic that there is, and it's very little logic, actually is in the application level. Um, refactoring the back end of it would be more interesting. Yeah. But Weblinks is very similar. It doesn't really have any front end domain logic. There's nothing to it. So, so it's not actually that interesting to do that. What might be interesting to actually probably do a parallel implementation that's it on users, just see what it is and make a parallel service here implementation. That's also a link. So that for the smaller things is kind of useless for end users, but it's really useful. Other than the kind of idea of the case in that. So something that's actually useful. So it also actually kind of proves the possible backward compatibility of two different implementations at the same time. So, so are, you, are you saying like we should do a, an alternative version of COM users? Yeah, something okay. like that. Right. Yeah. I'm sure it's easiest for the COM users for like whatever, whatever is easiest, but proves uh, that two things can exist at the same time. Yeah. And because actually they're writing to the same data structure, they are not really affecting anything that we do. Right, yeah. That's one possible approach. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, in that case, thank you very much.